I'd like to welcome you today and thank you for joining us for the 2022 program series Living Well Wednesday. My name is Sherilyn Jackson. I'm Extension Specialist in Family Consumer Sciences, and I'm going to be your host for today. Our Living Well Wednesday is a virtual learning series hosted by K-State Research and Extension Family Consumer Sciences professionals from across the state of Kansas. Many of our topics will touch on a wide variety of essential skills and empower you and your family to live, work, and thrive. Before we get started, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping rules. First, be respectful and open of others throughout the presentation. Feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box and comments into the chat box. The Q&A box does have a feature where you can ask anonymously if you're more comfortable with that. Our monitors, Ashley and Christina, will make sure to go over the questions at the end of the presentation. Today's session will be recorded and posted to our Living Well Wednesday webpage, along with additional resources. You'll be able to find all future and past programs on our website as well. And lastly, a friendly reminder that our Living Well Wednesday holiday series will feature healthy and prepared for the holidays on December 14. Then the series resumes in 2023, where we discuss a new topic every second and fourth Wednesday in January, February, and March. Be sure to check our Living Well website for additional details on registration and those topics for 2023. We do want to acknowledge that KSRE, excuse me, KSRE is um, an equal opportunity employer. Therefore, we do not discriminate against anyone. So if there is a special request or concern that you need to allow for you to attend our programs, please reach out to us. I want to thank our presenter for today. And Melissa Atchison serves as pastor for Manhattan Mennonite Church, and she's also a certified spiritual director who trained at the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, and she has a Master of Divinity degree from there as well. She has lived with her spouse, Bob, in Manhattan for over 25 years where they have raised their four children. I'm just delighted to have Melissa join us today, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sherilyn. Thanks for inviting me to share on this topic today. Last week, I was with my mother for her 95th birthday, and she has a lifetime of joys and losses that she is remembering and processing every day. And she does that with great courage. And as I've listened to her stories and the stories of others who have trusted me to listen, I've been blessed to learn that each person who lives through loss is an expert on their own experience of grief. Each one of you who is lonely or anxious is the expert on your particular way of encountering those feelings. And if you're here as a person who isn't currently coping with loss and loneliness personally, you know someone who you care about that you want a companion through those times, remember that everything they are feeling is appropriate to feel. So as we move forward into some ideas for how to cope, I wanna begin by inviting you to try a breathing practice with me. And yes, we're all already breathing, thanks be for that. And there are ways of breathing more intentionally that can help us anytime we are overwhelmed. So if you'll share the first slide, please. I am an outdoors person, so I've chosen some scenery for us. But you can also choose to close your eyes if that's your preference while I talk us through this breathing practice. Let's begin, if you're willing, by checking in with your body. It's best to have your feet both on the floor unless you'd rather sit crisscross applesauce. So find that connection between your body and the chair or floor, or your feet and the floor if you're standing, or if you're lying down. Find that connection between all the parts that touch the floor, that curve in just the right place to be in contact with the floor, right? Those curves. So become aware of the support that you feel there 
and the gravity that holds you. As you are being still, consider the bones that stack up in your back. All those marvelously shaped vertebrae that align from your tailbone to the top of your neck. And whether you're sitting or standing, I invite you to imagine a string that extends straight upward from your backbone through the top of your head. And allow this string to gently pull you straighter, a smidge taller, creating a bit of extra space for your breath. And when you're ready for your next inhale, I invite you to breathe in, filling not just your upper chest, fill up all the space, expanding your tummy too. Try that a couple of times. Deep inhales. And then, if you haven't been, close your mouth and inhale only through your nose. And then open your mouth to exhale through your mouth. Inhale nose, exhale mouth. And now we'll add a pause. Inhale, hold, exhale, hold. I'll count for us. Inhale, two, three, four, pause, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, pause, two, three, four. If you'd like, keep that up, counting to yourself if it helps. I hope that you feel a sense of calm. The more you practice this way of breathing, the better you'll get at remembering to try it when you're in a situation of anxiety or a wave of sadness. Now, I'm told that a wave of strong emotion typically lasts 90 seconds. Yeah, that's just a minute and a half. I found that if I can start breathing deeply, as soon as I recognize one of those waves, I can ride it out with four or five breaths. And then I'm calm enough to ask myself, what is it that I need? Next slide, please. I'd like to say that I believe we're dealing with a myth. I think of idyllic holiday joy as a concept driven by consumer culture. It goes like this, if you don't yet feel joyful, buy some more, right? And I'm afraid that often this expectation of automatic joy hits hardest the people who are not feeling happy with the extra burdens of worry that something is wrong with them, guilt that they're not trying hard enough, and that they're ruining other people's joy. I wish I could pass out filters, maybe like special glasses that are designed to eliminate the false promises of this season and monitor your expectations for a joy-filled holiday. Next slide. What I can do is spread the notion that you and your loved ones have permission to feel everything that you feel at holiday time, at any time. We were created to have emotions that give us information about what we need. I believe there is healing potential in busting this myth and giving permission to feel sad, anxious, lonely, as well as joyful sometimes all at the same time. Next slide, please. Now here's a, a favorite tool of mine. They're called feelings and needs cards. And this 
image shows just about half of the deck. There will be a website in the resources slide at the end where you can find these for free to print your own set. Because we do have the capacity to feel more than one feeling at a time, this activity gives us space to sort out names for those feelings and then needs that the feelings point to. You can use these alone or with a partner. So here's an example of how this can work. Next slide, please. You tell me that you are feeling lonely, fragile, and disconnected. Next slide. I ask if you may be needing presence and support, tenderness and or kindness, community and or closeness for the disconnection, and love. And you can say whether that fits or not. And for the needs that do fit, then I can ask you if there's any of these needs that I can offer to meet for you. Let's say, do you want to try joining my coffee group for community to meet that need? Or would it help if I ran errands for you or with you for a while? Next slide. If I'm using the cards alone, offering my self-empathy, which is a vital skill to practice, I may flip through the whole deck and find that this is the current mix. I'm feeling all of these. <clears throat> and then I take my time going through the needs cards, asking myself with each one, do I need that? And I always play the empathy card. Next slide, please. If there's some words not yet in your vocabulary, you can pause and look them up. Expanding your choices, of ways to describe how you're feeling is good self-care. And give yourself time to do this activity whenever you want to. Try it when you're feeling emotions that are more welcome too. Anytime I'm overwhelmed, I can discover something here. And the more I practice with these, the better I am at making guesses for what others are feeling. So even without the cards, it's okay to say, Oh, are you feeling withdrawn? And then help someone learn what they need. Next slide. One more tip about feelings. In North American culture, anger is an easily accessible emotion that's often the tip of an iceberg of feelings. And it's all right to identify anger as your emotion toward the person in front of you, or the one who is missing, or even towards your higher power. Because, hey, that's biblical. <laughs> the psalmists were angry a lot. <laughs> Just remember to look below the surface, too. The feelings beneath anger also need your attention. Next slide. Numbness might be another experience of this season, if you've been through a traumatic loss. And we might think of that as the opposite of overwhelm. The Reverend Tilda Norberg, founder of Gestalt Pastoral Care, which I'm studying to practice, identifies numbness as an aspect of trauma. She says that during the emotional and spiritual storm, we're filing away images and stories of the experiences in our memory. Later, there can come denial and paralysis or numbness. She says, paralysis is not necessarily bad and it does not reveal cowardice, emotional weakness or spiritual failure. Out of numbness, can emerge a sort of inner organization in which it is possible to feel one emotion at a time instead of all of them at once. Numbness can preserve us until we find the right time and place to let go. Thank God we can create emotional firewalls 
that keep us from being consumed with pain or fear. Fascinatingly, we know that memories and emotions that are not expressed in depth find a home in our body's muscles. Yeah, the emotional and spiritual distress can be embodied as tense, achy muscles, sore and stiff joints, constricted breathing, a stomach full of knots. And I mentioned this so that you might begin to understand another connection between our bodies and our emotions and to give you hope for healing from even these intense experiences. If you want to know more about Gestalt Pastoral Care, you'll find that website in the resources slide at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. I also need to mention the importance of taking suicidal thoughts and talk seriously. If you or someone you care about is in a deeper place of loneliness, loss, depression, and harming self is part of that ideation, this is a good place to reach out for help. This is the new mental health hotline and it's active across the US. Every one of us should add this to our phone contacts, 988. The conversation about depression can start with one's doctor or therapist or pastor. If it's gotten to a risk level for self-harm, make the call. This too is helping someone, someone's needs be met. Next slide. So breathing can work well in the moment to help me cope. And the feelings and needs cards work well at the time of strong emotions or after I've come through an incident and need to process it. And we can use feelings and needs cards as we are anticipating an event. For example, you're invited to a social gathering to celebrate let's say a caroling party or the parade of lights or whatnot. You can go through the cards or just a list of emotions if you're not really into using the card deck. Picture yourself there at the event if you can. How do you feel? This may help you know that you will need a, to ride with someone else so you're not arriving and leaving alone. Or you may discover that you want to go, but you need to have a specific plan for how long you'll stay and what you want to do afterwards. Or it may inform you that you don't want to go to that event. Please give yourself permission to say, no thanks. Next slide. Whatever winter holiday you identify with is likely a trigger date itself, as can be all the other dates through the year associated with your loss. Birthdays, anniversaries, dates of deaths. These are likely predictable times of extra suffering for you. And I'd like to suggest you make a plan ahead of time where you want to be that day, who you want to be with you, what you want to be doing. This is an expansion of knowing you need support, empathy, nurture. Within whatever limits are realistic for you, I encourage you to be proactive and your plan doesn't have to be expensive. Now, if being on the beach somewhere to celebrate Kwanzaa or Christmas is doable for you. How lovely. <laughs> but you can also opt for being not far from home with a good listener or alone, whatever is best for you. You can choose music that will feed your soul that day. You can choose a special meal menu 
You can build in time to take a walk or a drive to see some natural beauty. You can make time to write in a journal or to watch a good movie that you know will make you cry or to volunteer at a community meal or a long-term care facility. You could get a massage or buy a really good scotch and share it with a friend. If you are a person of prayer, you can ask others to be praying for you that day, or maybe even with you in person. Next slide. There are countless little spiritual practices that may be helpful to you. Beyond participating in whatever corporate faith tradition you may belong to, I wonder what it would be like for you to add some candle lighting to each day during this dark season. Or place a photo of someone you're missing in a prominent place and have a cup of tea or a glass of wine with them every day. I hope you get the idea that you can shape these practices with your own creativity. Here's one from an Advent devotional that I'm using this year. I chose a stone that represents <clears throat> a specific hard thing that I'm carrying into December this year. I can hold this stone as I pray about this difficulty, then I rewrap it in cloth that represents God's loving care and presence. Next slide, please. These are all avenues of empathy. Empathy is a daily requirement for all of us, whether we're feeling bad or not. I've learned a lot about empathy from the writings and talks of Brene Brown. Brene Brown is a professor of social work and philosophy, a researcher and a storyteller with lots to say about vulnerability, courage, and living wholeheartedly. And I believe her when she says empathy is not pizza. Empathy is not a limited resource. And this helps us understand why there is no place for comparing our suffering to someone else's suffering. For example, there's no point in saying things like, I don't know why this is hitting me so hard. So-and-so has it way worse and they are able to function. There's no point in going there. If empathy was finite, then taking a slice of it would mean there's less for someone else. And then we would need to decide whose loss is greater, but it doesn't work that way. Empathy is in infinite supply. So have some more, give it to yourself, give it to everyone you meet and ask for it or set yourself up to receive it every day. And this is where it's vital to know the difference between empathy and sympathy. So next slide, please. I find Brene's description of the difference between empathy and sympathy to be hugely helpful in guiding my own behavior and for setting boundaries in interactions with others who may want to help during a time of loss. This is a fun three minute video that animates a segment of one of Brene's lectures. So you can run that now, please. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. 
recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, (laughs) it's bad, uh uh-huh. No, you want a sandwich? (laughs) Um, Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. (laughs) John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. You can find this video and lots more resources on Brene Brown's website. That'll be listed in the resources at the end. And I encourage you to set your boundaries to allow in the people who will come into the sacred space of grief with you and keep out the sympathizers. Now, let's talk specifically about what is helpful from others. So you can answer this question. What has been said to you in person or maybe written in a card when you were down? That has really been helpful. Can you remember anything that you could share here in chat? And here's a few starters that I've gathered uh, along with, you know, we're not going to say at least. We'll remember that, I think. So the best practice will always be listening. It's much better than speaking. Beyond that, sharing food or gift cards for food is is great. Praying with or for a person, if that fits. Um, Helping them make plans for the who, what, where of trigger days. Offering a hug and then waiting until you have permission to give that hug. And how about asking them for help with something? If this is a person that you know well enough to know what their skill set is and what they could share with you. And then writing cards to that person, not just once. Okay, next slide, please. Ask the person who is struggling whether these are things that they want. Tell them in the way you behave that they are the best source for understanding the situation that they're in. Next slide. At at the holidays, we can expect increased family tensions, elevated stress from extra tasks, and deepening grief in the face of unrelenting cheer. We may also be completely taken by surprise by the way a song triggers a memory of someone no longer here, or the way an aroma takes us back to a place of comfort we can't go to anymore, or coming across a physical object that can pull the emotional rug out from under us. 
Grief is a shapeshifter, and someone suggested the other day, so is joy. So you can go to the next slide. That's the resources slide that I've created with uh, some of the things that I mentioned and a, a couple of titles of books as well that I find helpful. In case you'd be interested in finding a spiritual director, that's why I included the Spiritual Directors International website. And then there's a second resource slide that you can share now. More resources from the Extension Service. And you can end the slides if you're ready to. I'd like to suggest that the memories that sneak up on us can be welcomed as gifts. They may help us feel things that we are finally ready to feel. And they are connections to love that we have experienced. One person I spoke to about holiday sorrow told me that the people no longer living in their family gave them everything they needed to carry on. And so carrying on the traditions are what helps their family this time of year. It's a way to remember the values that those dear ones passed on. And that's what keeps them going. Others need to let those traditions go and create new ones when old ones are making them feel miserable. Both of these approaches and anything in between are good choices. So I'm willing to take questions now if there are any. And if not, I'm just very thankful to have been invited here for knowing that this topic is as important to you as it is to me. So thank you for attending or watching this webinar later. Most of all, thank you for being a person who wants to learn how to offer care to yourself or someone else. This is what mends our broken world, one relationship at a time. Melissa, if someone has a question or a comment, if they'll raise their hand, I can unmute them so they can ask it outright instead of having to type it in the chat box if they prefer that. Okay. Yes, you can find the hand raising option at the bottom of your screen in reactions. Melissa, we had someone say that they like the idea of lighting candles in remembrance of lost loved ones. And they love the session and they're thankful for the information that you provided. Good. Kelly asked, how do you assist someone who needs help with grief of a stillborn child? Hmm. That's a particularly difficult one, isn't it? There is a book that I listed in resources that is The Compassionate Congregation, um, a handbook for people who care. It's not specifically oriented to any particular uh, denomination or faith tradition. And there is a section in here for loss of a child, a miscarriage or a stillborn child. Um, yeah, there, there are some resources being developed, thankfully, um, for people who are living with that experience. And I just put in the chat box, uh, just a reminder that a copy of today's webinar recording and the resources mentioned will be posted on our Living Well Wednesday website. So that uh, URL address I just put in the chat box. And we just received another question. Do you think it is a good idea to ask others to share memories at a family dinner of the person who is gone? I think so. I, I also think it's a good idea to warn them ahead of time that you will be asking that question. Um, for some people, 
that will give them an opportunity to um, excuse themselves from the table if it's something if it's a place that they're not ready to go to yet. <clears throat> For others, it could give them a little preparation time and they can uh, be able to share even more because they've considered it ahead of time. And we had another comment on the stillborn child. Um, due to this, the person is gambling and losing all of their money and now has no funds for rent, et cetera. Oh, this is very sad. Yes. You want to be able to companion that person, not just through the loss of their child, but also these challenges that... I don't know, would would you maybe surmise that they're trying to numb themselves or um, treat their own depression with these choices that they're making, right? Um, yeah, these are really complicated issues. I hope that you can walk alongside them. Um, and share with them about resources that are available in your community um, for financial assistance and also support with um, the gambling addiction if, if it's become an addiction. Yeah. There's another question, Melissa. Uh How do you deal with PTSD from loss? It feels like I'm living in a whole different world now that he's gone. And every day I'm afraid my mom will die next, like I'm holding my breath. Mm, I'm so sorry. Yes, we are learning. I think experts are learning more about PTSD all the time, that it's, it's much more common um, than professionals had expected. Um, that many of us have experienced um, traumatic things that continue to affect us for a long time. I would say if it feels like you're holding your breath, you probably are. And I would say to begin by taking take some deeper breaths. Um, you can go back and watch the recording of that very first part of today's webinar and uh, see if you could do some breathing that would help you first. And it's like putting on your mask first in the airplane, right, before you help someone else. Um, take care of yourself, yes, and find someone you can confide in as a good listener as as you um, are awaiting whatever will happen to your loved one. I so appreciate the way you all are being so vulnerable and sharing these painful experiences. Melissa, we had another comment from Sally. Having contact with others who have experienced a similar loss can be very helpful. I've experienced a similar a loss similar to the number of my church family, and we were able to help one another. I also experienced a loss that was not one anyone I knew had experienced, and that was much that was ever so much harder. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there are uh, more and more groups that can support one another through grief. Um, I know locally here in Manhattan, we have some that uh, people can join and to know that you are not the only person is definitely very important. Good. Someone shared the program is called Grief Share. Thank you for sharing that. Lisa, thank you so much for 
this time with us today and for these <clears throat> helpful tips um, and ideas to consider and for the time that you spent with us today in, in preparing this presentation. I'm sure many of us have gained things that we can do to take care of ourselves better and to be uh, practicing empathy and being supportive um, in difficult situations. You will, um, those of you <clears throat> with us today, will receive a follow-up message with the link to the recording of today's presentation. And feel free to share that with others that you think it might be helpful to them. I do want to remind you once again, we have one more presentation in our series health. It's called Healthy and Prepared for the Holidays. If you've registered for um, any one of these sessions, then, then you've registered for them all. You'll get a reminder of that in a couple of weeks. And lastly, if you would like more information or additional resources, please reach out to your local extension agent. And if you're not sure where that local office is, you can find it by going to ksre.edu um, and you'll be able to hover over your county and find your local office that way. Again, thanks to all of you and have a good rest of your afternoon.